our world, our blue marble, our pale blue dot, should be a place that we all treasure. Ever since humans began to hunt, and then to farm, and then to build, we have affected the world around us. For most of our history, that impact was contained, but gradually it began to spiral. As we plundered natural resources, stripped away the forests and the richness of the soil, and pumped toxic fumes into the air, the age of humans became an age of climate disaster and ecological collapse. This is an age that demands to be documented, with stories that demand to be told. But how can we tell the story of the Earth in the age of humans? And who will tell it? Humans are storytelling animals. Ever since we first began to communicate, we have spun tales to help us understand ourselves and the world around us. Stories have a transformative power to captivate, convince, and embolden. Today, museums are the crafters, keepers, and tellers of our society's stories. Museums speak to a vast audience across the globe and hold a special place in the public trust. We have enormous potential to contribute our informed and trusted voices to global debates about the climate emergency and how humanity can address it. Much great work has been done by museums around the world. But what can we, as museum professionals, do to transform any museum into a climate museum? And how can we ensure that the stories of human impact on the planet are documented and shared, today and for future generations? Museums are places of knowledge, they are places of understanding, and they are also places for questions. So I absolutely believe that all museums have a responsibility to address sustainability and climate issues. These are global issues that by their very nature affect our world and everything in it. And museums should, as many are, be leaders in starting these conversations and creating a supportive atmosphere where this dialogue can continue. This means creating spaces, physical or digital or otherwise, where people can speak and where people can listen. I think that museums as educators do have that responsibility. Museums are often highly respected. They're places that people come to learn about the world. And even though there can be a tendency to associate museums with the past, actually museums are very much about also shaping the future, and that is about not shying away from issues that are important. I think that all museums have a responsibility to address sustainability and climate issues. Um, they are places of cultural and historical interest that draw numerous, often intelligent, um, interested crowds from all over the world. Um, and, and as such, I think that the perfect place to draw attention to important issues, be they economic, social, um, political, um, or environmental like this and to in a lot of cases galvanize action on for example um, climate change so I think it is a responsibility of a museum or a cultural institution to stay relevant. I, I think museums play uh, an important public role and and this definitely extends to to issues on climate change and and, and sustainability um, and, and for us as the as the National Museum of Singapore I, we, we see this, this topic of, of the environment as, as a very central part uh, of the story of Singapore that we present. And uh, we try to, to find creative ways of, of engaging our visitors on that topic. I think museums and especially history museums like our uh, are institutions that deal with the past uh, in order to understand the present and to, to imagine the future or to express it differently, to, to act, to, to give tools, to act for a better future. I'm personally, I'm firmly believing in the social responsibility of museum. I even think that uh, museum have a kind of activist role to, uh, to play. Uh, they should be uh, eye openers. Um, they should be tools for critical thinking, but also add complexity to the debate because it's, it's, it's never black and white. And I think museum have a role here to, uh, to give more tool to understand all the, the situation in, uh, in all its complexity. Any 
object can tell a climate story, and any museum can become a climate museum. We will now take you on a virtual tour around the globe, discovering how museum and cultural professionals are using their skills as storytellers to share new interpretations of objects, structures and landscapes through the lens of climate and sustainability. Demonstrating how these issues affect everything and everyone around us. Join us as we travel the world in search of testaments from the age of humans. My name is Sonia Kelleher Combs and I am an Alaskan artist. I would like to first begin by acknowledging the land on which I live, um, the home of the Denina Athabascan people, and I would like to thank them for their stewardship of this beautiful place. I am an artist of mixed descent. I'm Inupiaq and Athabascan. The way I think about the work that I create is it's, it's a lot like you know, harvesting off the land. And so a lot of times I'll work in cereal and um, make multiples of a single form, um, kind of creating a community is what I would like to, I, th I liken it to. Um, each individual is a part of the whole and that's the way I grew up. That's the way that, um, you know, we weren't all individuals. We were a part of a collective, a family, a community. I want to make a commentary about our relationships to each other and to um, the natural world. And so I just was so disgusted with this idea of genetically modifying an animal so that you could harvest it faster and consume it faster, which is um, mass consumption is such a Western idea. And also how we are using so much plastic that is devastating our um, e ecosystem. Almost everybody I know spends time berry picking or harvesting fish and processing it and sharing food with each other, hunting and, um, and taking, care of, um, taking care of the land and being responsible for this place. Everybody at some point was indigenous and they had a relationship to the land and that's how they, they expressed themselves, their, their connection. Everything was made you know, with purpose um, from natural materials and every object was imbued with some, some sort of significance. When I think of people going to buy something at Walmart or wherever they're going shopping, those, a lot of those objects aren't meant to last. They're meant to break down, so you have to go get a new one, you know? So um, that's the way, I, I, everything that in my house has got some special kind of connection to family and uh, community and um, is meant to be passed down to my nieces and nephews. and. Um, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's continuity. Kiara Koto, greetings to you all from the Otapoti Dunedin in beautiful Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now I'm standing in front of the ceremonial doorway to the museum, a waha ora, gifted to us by Naitahu, carved by James York, a Naitahu ceremonial carver. The door is replete with multiple significances. The timber is recycled rimu wood, a native tree with a traditional role in warding off malign spirits. The four manaya, intertwining mythical creatures, represent the four Naitahu sub-tribes in the museum's collecting area. They connect with the ground, representing the strong connection between mana whenua and the land, and the intertwined nature of their whakapapa, or genealogy. The whole structure sits below a representation of the albatross, a bird that is hugely important to everyone in Otapoti Dunedin, as we are home to the world's only mainland col albatross colony. And interspersed throughout the Waha Ora are pieces of ponamu, New Zealand greenstone, and power shell, both of great significance to Māori. Flecks of gold and coal representing the mining activities of the Scottish and Chinese communities, which generated great wealth in the 19th century. There are three colours, white representing bone and speaking to the presence of the whalers and seal hunters, the first European settlers, and blue representing the sea and red the land. 
The Waharoa serves as a strong reminder to us of the need to give due respect to the land and of the need to draw upon the wisdom and knowledge of Mana Whenua in its stewardship. And so these generous gifts to us from Mana Whenua act as a challenge to us that a true understanding of the land and of our place in it needs to take full account of different perspectives and different ways of celebrating our identity. My name is Krishna Julius. I'm acting director of the District 6 Museum, but my usual home is the archive of the museum. One of the objects in our collections that we feel really speaks to the context of climate change and its impact on people today and even people who visit the museum is that of the street signs that you used to find in District 6. The street signs for us, it's a very poignant reminder of forced removals. District 6 was a community of 60,000 people who were racially classified and based on their racial classification were actually moved to areas on the Cape Flats. Once people were moved, um, we had to develop new transport systems to accommodate the movement of people back into the city and back into the central business district to work. And what we really realize is that the impact of climate change can be felt there. It's felt in the fact that our carbon emissions in the city of Cape Town are quite high, our air quality is quite poor, and it really speaks to the idea that if communities remain local, they work um, in one place, the social lives happen in one place, the cultural lives happen in one place, um, that the, 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 just the push and pull between having to move between places, using public transport, disappears. So for us, when we are thinking about climate change, we really think about this sort of historical, long historical context, that people who were once in the city, bought locally, worked locally, didn't have to really move beyond the city, all of a sudden between the 1960s and the 1980s found themselves abandoned on the Cape Flats with no resources, and a public transport had to develop to actually accommodate them as well. And we see this today, we have traffic jams in Cape Town, sometimes Table Mountain is covered in smog, and we really want to be able to say that even though we are a museum about forced removals, about a very particular local history in Cape Town, in South Africa, at the same time there is a much bigger debate around how for South Africans apartheid really has impacted the way in which we use energy, how we think about energy or maybe don't even think about our energy use as well. I'm Brent Glass, uh, Interim Director of the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. We want to talk a little bit about the National Building Museum itself as an artifact of, of, uh, that, that has a number of examples of um, uh, addressing issues of climate uh, in the 19th century and, and the great innovations that uh, uh, took place uh, in the late 19th century in this building, uh, designed by uh, General Montgomery Meigs, who was the quartermaster uh, general during the Civil War in charge of supplying the Union troops, uh, but also a very innovative uh, engineer and architect. And he had some interesting ideas about making the building more uh, functional and a better place to work in, including providing more light, more ventilation, uh, more space, uh, for the for the people who were working uh, in the pension building, and they also designed the pension building to um, have this enormous uh, event space, the Great Hall, which measures I think 300 feet by 150 feet and, and is about 160 feet high. And I want to uh, introduce uh, the registrar for the Na uh, National Building Museum, uh, Nancy Bateman, who has some. Uh, some documents to show us and uh, some observations about uh, the National Building Museum, the Building Museum's home located in the Pension Building. Uh, our historic home has a lot of really interesting features um, that were pretty innovative at the time and still could be uh, emulated in some way um, building today. One of the main ways that our building um, was sort of a green building way back in the 1880s 
was it was it's built out of 15 million bricks. The majority of the grand buildings in Washington, D.C. are built with marble um, brought in from Alabama and other states throughout the nation. But our building uh, was created with materials right here in Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. It was, it was a pretty innovative thought um, to try to keep your office workers healthy, to create your building out of something, out of materials that are very renewable, um, and to design an entire space uh, thinking of ways to have it be more efficient at the time. I'm here at the National Museum of Qatar where I work as a documentations coordinator. And I'm here today in Gallery 6 titled Life on the Coast. And as you can see here behind me are the objects of focus, which are gypsum panels or gypsum carvings. Now these were locally made in Qatar and often they are used to symbolize the connection between Qatar and the wider region. However, gypsum panels can also tell a different story, which is that of sustainability and of sustainable architecture and building. In the past, buildings in Qatar used to be constructed using locally sourced materials, as well as they were constructed in a way that maintained cool air without the use of electricity. The rooms in Qatar were built uh, with high ceilings to maintain cool air from the night throughout the day. Rooms were also constructed with small windows to regulate temperatures both throughout the summer and the winter. This alternative interpretation of gypsum panels or gypsum carvings can allow visitors to appreciate their local heritage. It can also inspire future infrastructure techniques that are akin to traditional techniques which are, which are more environmentally friendly or more sustainable. And by looking at um, gypsum panels through the lens of sustainability, we were able to re-examine our collection and we discovered that many objects in our collection can be used to advocate for climate change and for sustainability. So perhaps this is a reminder to go back to your collections, look at your objects and look at the different stories that your objects can tell. The BT Biodiversity Museum sits on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people and it forms part of the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. As a natural history museum, every single one of our over 2.1 million specimens can tell a story about the climate and the changing earth. The Spencer Entomological Collection holds interest to many scientists studying climate change, and this is partly because the lifespans of insects are relatively short, meaning that changes in a species that occur over many generations can sometimes be observed and noted, not just in the lifetime of our collection, but also within the lifetime of a single researcher. This specimen here is a beautiful viceroy butterfly, Lemonitas archipus. This butterfly forms part of the Spencer Entomological Collection in the BT Biodiversity Museum, and it was collected in 1901. Unfortunately, this species has been extirpated from our province of British Columbia meaning that it is no longer found within this area. And the last record of a viceroy butterfly in BC was in Lillooet in 1930. The viceroys in BC were observed to feed on apple foliage, but apple orchard pests, including the apple coddling moth, began to make their mark on the apple harvest. The coddling moth was introduced to BC from Europe in the early 1900s, and it is the warming weather that is believed to have contributed to the resurgence of this orchard pest. And with increased pest activity, pesticide spraying of the apple orchards was introduced, and this in turn led to the extirpation of this beautiful butterfly from BC. These specimens give us a picture of what life was like 10 years ago, 100 years ago, and even more. And knowing how it was, helps us understand how and why it has changed. And in turn, this knowledge helps inform our choices as we prepare for the future. Good afternoon and welcome to the company gardens in the city of Cape Town, South Africa. 
But arguably the greatest monument that I want to draw your attention to is the Table Mountain which stands in the far distance. Table Mountain is an icon of the Table Mountain National Park and the Cape Floral Kingdom which is a world heritage site. The Table Mountain is a living monument because it nourishes the city with a constant steady supply of water brought by the clouds that pass over the flat top peak and functioning as an exciting tourist attraction. During the water crisis of 2018, it seemed as if our water supply would be cut off and one of the few sources of natural water that was still available to the residents of the city was the Table Mountain. As you can see, the various ravines that cut down from the, from the mountain are streams of water that supplied precious water in small but significant amounts that became more and more vital during the water crisis. And so in that sense the Table Mountain brings home the story of the tension between the need for economic uplift and income generation as well as the need for caring for the environment. Hi, my name is Kaiti Kami. I am from Malekula Island, an island up north of Anuatu. The object I am going to talk about today is originally from Malekula. And as you can see, it is a headdress. This headdress is called Nawel, and it is only worn by men to ritual ceremony. One thing which is good about this object is because it doesn't harm our forest or doesn't do anything about the climate change. Because all the things we used to make this object are all collected from our forest, originally from Vanuatu. As you can see, the beautiful colors, they are made out of the soil and also the forest or the trees. When doing it, we didn't do any harm to the forest. So that's why we say all our objects in our museum, and especially this headdress doesn't do anything bad to the climate. As of today, we started to change our living, we can experience the differences. In the past, the climate is different from today. That's some things which, if we hold on to our culture, it can help to sustain the climate in our country. Hello, my name is Gonzalo Herrera Delicado, independent curator and architect, associate lecturer at Central St. Martins and former curator of the architecture program at the Royal Academy of Arts in London. The object I am presenting isn't a collection object, but instead an object that can be found in any museum across the world. This banner is one of the many banners often used by museums and other cultural institutions to advertise their exhibitions and wider programs on the facade of their buildings. Its productive life is that of uh, the average length uh, of a museum exhibition, which is around three months. However, even the most sustainable options for this material can take years or even decades to biodegrade. Museums generate a huge amount of waste with every new exhibition through the construction of new walls, planes, and other displays. They have an important impact on their carbon footprint we have the potential to be minimized by putting in place new strategies that promote a more sustainable and uh, use of recycled and recyclable materials. Ecovisionaries was an exhibition that examined humankind's impact on the planet and presented innovative approaches to reframe our relationship with nature. Through film, installation, architectural models, and photography, the works in this exhibition interrogated how architects, designers, and artists our reaction today to a rapidly changing world. The exhibition designer's approach was to build little from scratch, making use of existing resources and reclaim materials as much as possible. The object I selected, the promotional banner used on the facade of the building to advertise the exhibitions, were used for creating structure hanging screens to arrange the space. In addition, freestanding plinths and furniture were borrowed and salvage from recent and past exhibitions. 
This was also an opportunity to review the wider sustainability strategy of the museum. And among other initiatives, they are restricted their energy suppliers, and it is now powered by 100% renewable energy. They are also removed single use plastic and, for example, introduced compostable takeaway cups and cutlery in the cafes and restaurants. These are just some of the many initiatives that every single museum and cultural organization can take place. My name is Rodrigo Rantia and I am the gallery manager at Reba. The object I want to talk to you about today is called the Lookout. It is a small cabin designed by architects Angus Ritchie and Daniel Tyler of uh, Process Craft Studio. And it sits in the, um, in the shores, shores of uh, Loch Voyle in the, in the highlands of Scotland. This cabin was featured in a show in 2019 called Making It Happen New Community Architecture. Takeshi uh, replicated a section of the lookout that we built in the gallery. We worked with Takeshi to make this structure fully dismountable. All the materials were to be donated to a charity called the Farm of Futures, who worked with Design Studio 121 Collective to repurpose not just the materials but the designs and create new structures for the farm. And I think this anecdote is a good example of how we are thinking about sustainability in museums. It, not just through content, not just through interpretation, but also thinking how we produce exhibitions, especially temporary exhibitions and, and touring shows, which are always a challenge because they are, from the start, they're produced to be to have a finite li lifespan, uh, especially talking about regards to materials and, and their carbon footprint. I hope this small example is a good conversation starter and it can prove some inspiration to colleagues and teams in other museums across the world that are faced with the same challenges but also want to work around ideas of sustainability and climate change. Hello, my name is JC Niala and I'm the acting keeper for anthropology at the Horniman Museum and Gardens in London. When I carry out community engagement, I often come back to two objects. These are objects that show us mistakes that we made in the past, but also good practices that are being carried out as we speak all over the world that have been for centuries and that we can take into the future. The first of these objects is a tortoiseshell comb from Victorian England. At that time, tortoiseshell was highly prized and used in various types of body adornments. If I'm in a school, I would ask the students, where do they think that the tortoiseshell came from? This leads into a conversation about unsustainable practices of sourcing or harvesting materials from places that are far away that can lead to their extinction or like in the case of the hawksbill sea turtle that provides tortoiseshell a threat of their extinction. Since 2014, it has now been a protected species, which shows some of the ways in which we are beginning to do better. So the second object I often use is a gourd. It's usually a Maasai gourd, which is highly decorated and beaded, and that are used by Maasai peoples in Kenya and Tanzania. But gourds are used all over the majority world in order to store food and keep it safe from pests and make it last longer, as food storage is critical for people who do not have access to electricity and therefore things like fridges. 
What I love about ethnographic collections is in built to them are the human stories about how we have interacted with our environments. And there's a lot that we can learn, not just from the collections, and share with others that can provide hope about ways in which we can be gentler on the earth and support her to make this world a better place for us all to live in. Hi, I'm Jenny Newell. I'm the manager of climate change projects here at the Australian Museum. We've just opened a new exhibition here. It's called Changing Climate. This is a canoe model that was made in Santa Cruz in the Solomon Islands. It sums up the hope that I have for, for people in the face of climate change, in all the, the many, many challenges we're facing. That there's so much ingenuity that we can all tap into. That there's that collective work that, that happens in communities in the Pacific, in all our communities here in Australia, wherever you are in the world, there's wonderful things that can be done by people working together and bringing their ingenuity to the problems that we're now facing. Across the Pacific, people are using canoes in all sorts of amazing ways now. So whether they're being used in a blockade of coal ships in Newcastle, bringing canoes from across the Pacific to stop the coal ships for a whole afternoon, or whether they're taking people to participate in international conversations that really need to be heard about how important it is for the developed world to be reducing their emissions. Canoes are taking part in these important forms of activism to try and reduce the impacts of climate change. People are coming up with amazing solutions to climate change all the time. As we were putting this, this exhibition together, we spoke to various people around the sorts of things that they're doing in their everyday lives to, to deal with climate change and the impacts it's having. So we talked to Charlie Prell, who's a farmer. He was able to, over years, find the, the capacity to have approval for wind turbines on his farm. And he's now a farmer of not just sheep, but also of wind. And that brings him in regular income, despite the drought. And he can also support two other families in the area. He, he employs two people. And that's all through the kinds of dedication, innovation and working together that, that you see across all human societies. He's joined Farmers for Climate Action and it's groups like that, that that really take individual concerns and take them up to national levels and and get those really important voices heard. I'm Daniel Tham, Senior Curator with the National Museum of Singapore. Behind me is the building that we've been occupying since 1887, when we were established as the Raffles Museum. Today, we tell the story of Singapore as situated in Southeast Asia and in conversation with the world. This is a drawing of a wrinkled hornbill. It is one of the drawings on display in our newly reopened Go Sing Chu Gallery, featuring our prized collection of natural history drawings commissioned and collected by the first British resident of Singapore, William Farker. Historically, hornbills were poached in our region for their casks. Sadly, hornbills, including the wrinkled hornbill, have been extinct in Singapore for more than a hundred years. When our visitors see this drawing in our gallery, many of them are reminded of another related species, the oriental pied hornbill and its amazing story of recently making a return to wild and even urban Singapore, despite also being thought to be locally extinct. In a subtle but powerful way, we are reminded of how much we've lost since then, owing to the loss of natural habitats and changes in our climate. At the same time, these drawings have been reinterpreted and brought to life in an immersive digital experience in our museum titled Story of the Forest. This is especially popular with families and children who can in turn learn more about the habitats, behaviours and endangered status of the species depicted. I'm Miriam Lloyd Evans, I'm an art curator and art historian with a specialism in modern and contemporary art from the Middle East region. I most recently worked as lead curator at the British Museum on their modern and contemporary collection and now I'm an independent curator. I'm choosing to speak about this work behind me, which is a wonderful work called Colour Correction 2 by Yazan Halili, um, an artist originally from Syria who lives and works in Palestine. 
This photograph depicts the Al Amari refugee camp, which is a um, refugee camp outside Ramallah city in Palestine, where just over 6,000 people live today. He has digitally altered the colour of all the buildings, as you can see in these vivid, bright colours, blues, greens, pinks, yellows, um, in a way to distort our vision of the camp and to talk about collective memory, loss and trauma, to see what it does to us, to our minds, to our discussions, to recolour the work, to recolour history. But in terms of climate change, we could look at the work and the people within the camp, the displaced people, and the fact that many, many people across the world, across Africa, um, across the Middle East, are displaced, are leaving their homes, are fleeing due to the effects of the climate crisis. This work was first exhibited in London in 2012 um, at the Truman Brewery as part of an exhibition called Hashtag Come Together. It was really about the power in coming together, the power of collective consciousness, the power of discussion and of breaking geographical, uh, societal language barriers through, through talking, through coming together. And I think that was quite powerful within the context of this work and within the context of what we're talking about. Hello, my name is Nancy Rossoff and I'm the Andrew W. Mellon Senior Curator of the Arts of the Americas Collection at the Brooklyn Museum in New York. In 2019, the relentless news about the raging deliberately set forest fires in Brazil, the impact of global warming on Arctic sea ice, and the Trump administration's assault on Native American sovereignty and ancestral homelands provided the urgency for developing the trailblazing exhibition, Climate in Crisis, Environmental Change in the Indigenous Americas. This 16 millimeter film basket by Onondaga Mi'kmaq artist Gail Tremblay directly addresses the threat of climate change on the indigenous peoples of the Arctic region and the planet as a whole. The work, which is, which is entitled When Ice Stretched On For Miles, was made in 2017. At first glance, it resembles a Victorian era Iroquois fancy basket, but Tremblay has substituted the traditional materials of black ash and sweet grass with strips of white film leader and exposed film from the 1967 documentary at a winter sea ice camp. In this documentary film, a Netzalist Inuit family have reenacted a director's ethnographic vision of what earlier Inuit life was like, such as traveling by dog sled and building igloos. Tremblay's basket points out the paradox of this ethnographic film, in which a director hailing from a culture that is in the business of developing the Arctic region and exploiting its oil and gas reserves nevertheless idealizes an Inuit way of life that no longer exists. Welcome to the Jockey Club Museum of Climate Change on the campus of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm George Ma, Head of Climate Action from the University Social Responsibility and Sustainable Development Office. One of the exhibits we're most proud of is the Shillong incorporated into the design of this polar gallery, which is the area I'm standing on right now. The Shillong, a literal snow dragon, is China's first research vessel capable of navigating through the frozen oceans of the polar regions. Here, visitors would not only find out the success of Shillong in contributions to our understanding of polar science, they will also see the various collections housed in this cabin, which itself is a gallery. From these collections, the visitors will learn about the impact of climate change on animals, plants and ecosystems. Outside, at the deck, we have a 30 meter wide panoramic video screen which makes the visitor feel as much as possible they are looking out to an open sea. This onboard experience does come with a strong wind coming from above. Here, the visitor will find out why and how scientists collect various kinds of data on things like ice core and sediment core to study the impact and extent of climate change. At some point, the visitor will be caught attention by a polar bear 
will surely appear in this region in this time of the year. We're leaving a question to the visitor from the video to prompt him to think more about what we can do for the Earth and for our children's generations. We hope that they will be able to take home some important message about whose responsibility climate change is. By presenting our exhibit using a storytelling approach that is taking the visitor on board to an Arctic expedition, we hope the visitor experience will be more engaging and first-hand, which is very important if we want to motivate behavioural change. Hello, I'm Maria Xenigarezu from Athens, Greece. With my colleague Elena Glitzi, we are going to tell you a story about an ancient pot and discuss the art of sustainable symbiosis between humankind and nature. And I'm Elena Glitzi, and I am particularly happy for contributing to this inspiring session on climate change and sustainability. Our destination will be Samos, an island of the Aegean, which, due to its strategic position between mainland Greece and the East and Black Sea and Egypt, enjoyed an unparalleled economic and cultural growth in the late 7th century BC. The object we chose to talk about is an ancient terracotta vase, which archaeologists call a kernos. The vase comes from the collections of the Archaeological Museum of Vasi. As you can see, its old-style display hardly pays any tribute to its unconventional beauty and as we are going to show, its underlying symbolism. This kernos was found during the excavations at the sanctuary of the goddess Hera, the so-called Heraeon in Greek. We know from the ancient writer Athenaeus that kerni vases containing foodstuffs of various kinds were offered to fertility deities during rituals. One such deity was Hera. This attribute of her went along with her local association with agricultural wealth and also with her established Panhellenic identity as the goddess of marriage who was present to all stages of a woman's life. As we know, in ancient societies, marriage was closely related to fertility. It was during her annual festival on the island, celebrating her sacred marriage to Zeus, king of the twelve Olympians, that this kernos, probably filled with barley, wheat, beans, honey, olive oil, wine and milk, would have been offered to Hera. The first thing catching our attention would be the worshippers. The bowl and the ram heads are related to Hera's capacity as the protectress of herds. It is certainly no coincidence that Homer described her as cow-eyed mistress and that the ox emblem also appears on the coinage of ancient Samos. In addition, the abundance of bovine and sheep skeletal traces at the sanctuary altar could be explained in this context. The ceramic pomegranate on the rim of the kernos, a fruit grown on Samian land, but also a symbol of abundance, fertility, marriage, life and rebirth, is relevant to the belief of the time that fruits rich in seed reflected Hera's nature as a fertility goddess. Furthermore, the seashell attests to the wealth of Samos' marine world, while the toad would have certainly been one of the many croaking in the marshes of the sanctuary. Finally, the lion and the monkey, exotic animals associated with the fauna of the Near East, would refer to the wildlife of Samos while pointing to the island's close contacts with the opposite coast of Asia Minor. Let us now explore how the Kernus relates to the wider context of sustainability. Samian landscape and the affluence of Samian land can definitely be traced behind the iconography of the vase. Indeed, ancient Samos combined a unique landscape of high mountains, fertile valleys and abundant waters. The island's mild climate favoured the cultivation of crops, fruit trees and olives, 
as well as the development of viniculture. As for the fauna of ancient Samos, that was equally rich, with several similarities with that of the neighboring Asia Minor. To conclude, the iconography of the Kernos can be seen as an epitome of the world, that surrounding ancient Samians. In addition, it represents a way of life which preserves the natural resources, employs traditional techniques, respects the changing of the seasons and is closely associated to festive events. As for the current climate change debate, it is useful to add that the Iraon, the site in which Kernos was unearthed and also an UNESCO World Heritage Site, is currently under threat due to global warming and the rising of sea level. Neither is it a secret that by 2100, many monuments and archaeological sites around the Mediterranean will have seriously been threatened by climate change. The latter will also affect the lives of Samos's local community, which depend on agriculture, wine and oil still being Samos's main products, but also on tourism. On a wider scale, climate change will also affect insular communities tangible and intangible heritage, while its economic and social consequences will be dramatic. People will face insecurity and most probably economic inequity. To survive, they will have to learn how to mitigate natural disasters and adapt to new life conditions. Those are difficult issues. Nevertheless, museums, as for of public discourse, and agents of change could and should initiate this debate. Welcome to Miraikan. Konnichiwa. Hello from the Geocosmos, our symbol exhibit. I am Ayuko Sakurai, one of the 40 science communicators working at Miraikan. Let me show you one example of how we bring scientific data to citizens through our exhibit. You see an air temperature simulation from 1851 up to 2100. Here, the average temperature was calculated from the data taken from 1951 to 1980. Based on that average, cooler air and hotter air are displayed in blue and red. So now, please carefully look at the Arctic region, which is the upper part of this globe. This area will get wider, showing a remarkable increase in temperature. By linking this visualization of data to news about the melting of sea ice, we can get a better understanding of the reality and of a possible future. Welcome to the House of European History. Bon dia, I am Anna, a project manager. We are in front of the displays about consumer society in our permanent exhibition. Did you know that the coffee plant is at risk due to climate warming? Can you imagine a single morning without a coffee? This would mean that this object, the Italian Mocha coffee machine, also known as Macchinetta, would be part of the past. Typically, we look at things from the societal changes point of view. What if we change our perspective a bit for all these objects? If we light up behind the scenes, where does it come from? How long did it travel? How was it bought by the museum? A coffee maker like this one has an average weight of 680 grams. Most of it from the aluminium, a little bit from the plastic. It can be used and reused again and again, potentially forever. At least it can be transmitted from one generation to another. And if one day it is broken, the aluminium is 100% recyclable. Despite that, this machineta has an impact on environment. All the objects in this display have. And we don't even speak about the production of the coffee itself. And what if we change a usual description by a label about its environmental footprint? What about the production behind the raw materials? What about the recyclability and the durability of the machine? And what if we replace our usual description by a label about its environmental footprint? 
What about the production behind the materials? What about the recyclability and the durability of the machine? And what if this machineta was abandoned in nature or land file instead of being in our museum? Thinking through a climate change lens contribute to public debate, to analyze current issues with the background knowledge of history. It opens the spectrum of interpretations, allowing the visitors to get out of their own reality, their zone of comfort. It stimulates creativity. It develops critical thinking to find alternative solutions and perhaps to adopt new behaviors out of the norm. Hello, my name is Darío Montañez and I'm coordinator of interpretation at the Biomuseo, which is a natural history museum located in Panama City in the Republic of Panama. The museum sits in a peninsula that juts out into the Bay of Panama, so we are surrounded by man-made landscapes and natural landscapes. From the atrium, if you look out towards the east, you can see the skyline of Panama City, and if you look out towards the west, we have the Pacific entrance to the Panama Canal and the mountains of Cerro Cabra and Palo Seco beyond. Panama has a lot of information and calculations as to how the climate crisis will affect our country, how global warming, how the rise in sea oceans will change our city forever. But that information by its very nature is not readily understandable by a general public that's not used to reading the complicated language of climate science. So as a science museum, we took on that project. We read reports, we produced infographics, and we generated this traveling exhibit that is right now in the museum, but we are planning to move it around different cities in the country to further the understanding of how we are facing a never before seen crisis that will affect us all forever because the best way to take action is to realize the urgency of the situation. By using the museum itself, its surroundings, the views from our atrium to talk about this allows us to make the point stick. So right now we're experimenting with interpreting the building itself and its setting, telling a story about the landscape that we can see from the building and how the building interacts with the environment that surrounds it. I really believe that museums are meant to serve our communities. And if we can't um, embrace this idea of sustainability and advocacy for climate change, then uh, really what are we doing? We're really missing the mark. Um, it is a global issue that needs to be addressed now and cannot be put off. Museums are highly trusted institutions within their communities and museum workers, no matter what your role is in a museum, can really do a lot to help people understand the urgency of climate change, the, the, the need for people to start talking about it and to feel more comfortable talking about it. I think museums are really well placed to, to get that message across. We're trusted and we've got a strong voice. So museums are in a wonderful position to already be able to foster community dialogue about sustainability and climate change. We are able to use our platforms to encourage people to ask questions, listen to the science and enact change. And with such varied and diverse visitorships, museums are actually able to have conversations and impact change at many different levels. I think museums, they have a, a very powerful voice that allowed to communicate not only to, to specialists, to people who in my case are architects or designers, but also to the general public. Uh, and to let them know about like these underlying issues uh, in this case of uh, behind climate change and, and how they can take actions. We are trying to create a base or a space that all the stakeholders, the fans, the NGO, uh, the scientists and everyone who care about climate change to can be gathered in our museum and be together okay, to do something in the community to inspire everyone in the community that climate change is something matters. As a science museum, our first step is to assure and coordinate accurate scientific information. 
The second is to visualize scientific data and make it easy to understand using exhibits. But I think the more um, effective way to be advocates is programmatically through our through the platforms that we have, both the digital platforms and the in-person platforms, the programs that we um, that we sponsor and develop, especially for young people, uh, to alert them to the the need for climate action. Uh, we have a, a great opportunity to be advocates for climate action. Just like any other change, it will not happen overnight, but it is one step that we can begin taking in the right direction gradually. Uh, I guess coming to coming to terms with what how museums, even even though they can serve to tell stories, the way they tell stories can be uh, can have very different costs in carbon depending on your design choices or your operation choices. There are some very significant issues of that Dunedin has to address in terms of climate change and so it's entirely natural for uh, the museum with its 300 plus thousand visitors a year um, uh, to to use that platform to explore those those areas. Here at the museum we tend to connect to people who are already pretty much on board with climate change and probably doing quite a bit about it in their everyday lives. They know it's a, it's a big issue. We need to get beyond the museum much more effectively. Many people think that the, that addressing uh, sustainability or changing like their protocols and, and what they do is something that it will incur on additional costs for the museum. But the reality is that it might incur on, on extra costs for a museum at the beginning when you make them for the first time, but when the protocols and processes are already in place, it's just a way, it's just like changing the pace of how things happen and changing like the, the, the methodologies of how to put together exhibitions or, or perform uh, in a museum. An exhibition is a very powerful way to, to, to address uh, these issues and, and engaging with a wider audience and um, working as a speaker and raising awareness even more about these issues. Um, but what is important is to review their practices from scratch, like going to the very basic or about how things could be made in a different way so we can face a more optimistic future than the one that, that we are facing at the moment. I think we, we definitely need to walk the talk uh, in, in how we run our operations and, and constantly uh, stay abreast of uh, advances in technology to, uh, to allow us to be more uh, energy efficient. So we call our visitors to basically consume less to participate more and to vote better. Uh, we see politics as a very important portion of the, of the issue here. Uh, we cannot allow the climate crisis not to be an issue in political debates. Well, one thing that, that um, is a distinctive element of museums in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is that we work um, in partnership with our uh, indigenous people wherever we can, the Maori. And um, there, there's a lot of uh, what we call Mātauranga Māori, uh, Māori knowledge uh, about how to live uh, more successfully and more sustainably in the environment. Um, in, my, in my video piece, I talk about how Māori have recognised um, the museum's um, status in relation to the environment. Now, Maori is actually a, a, a white, pe white people's word. Uh, Maori just means ordinary people. As far as Maori themselves are concerned, they are. There's a, still a very strong tribal structure, and so um, the local tribe um, is very connected to its landscape. In fact, it's, it's, in, it's intrinsic to its 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 way of being. Cultural industries are perfectly positioned to be both advocates and leaders for positive change within the sustainability movement. A contributing factor to the lagging response to the climate crisis has been the vast disconnect that exists between human culture and the infrastructural systems we take for granted. If we want people to advocate en masse for the energy transition, we have to make renewable energy sexy. Cultural institutions can act as the bridge and the catalyst for positive change. In large part, museums can be thanked for the cultural awakening over the past decades for the severity of the environmental problems that we face. With that accomplished, 
cultural institutions can now lead by example by meeting decarbonization goals in advance of the rest of the economy. These captivating and unexpected examples show how any object, landscape, building or monument can be used to tell the story of human impact on our planet. Documenting and sharing stories in this way can shed new light on the way we think about our collections and institutions and how we communicate with and about them. By using our expert knowledge and skills as storytellers, we can preserve and share testaments from the age of humans for our audiences today and in the future.